So thank you very much for this nice introduction and good afternoon. Um, I will be talking today about uh, biocontrol of foodborne pathogens on uh, fresh cut apples with naturally occurring bacteria and yeast antagonists. Um, this is something what is generally done at the end of presentations, uh, but I strongly believe that history of science is as important as science itself. So I would like to acknowledge two people who contributed greatly to <clears throat> some of the research that I will be presenting today. Dr. William Conway, uh, my collaborator for over 20 years. Uh, who, he was the head of the USDA Fruit Quality Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. And our joint postdoc, <clears throat> Dr. Breta Leverance, um, she was instrumental in some of the research that I will be presenting today. There are several, there are several key factors in controlling foodborne pathogens on uh, minimally processed uh, produce, and probably most of you are familiar with them, but let me just go quickly through that. Uh, quality of the raw produce is very important. And in our uh, situation, our uh, instance, I'm, I'm thinking about quality of intact apple. And it can, the microbial quality could be affected by cultivar, physiological state of the fruit, uh, growing conditions, and of course, handling and processing practices. Um, temperature, of course, is very important, especially maintaining that cold chain all the way to the consumer. And last but not least, of course, the contamination, mostly at this point physical and chemical type of the contamination. And I included here also biological decontamination in quotes, because often biocontrol is used as a preventive measure. So, um, Apples and pears are harvested in orchards to those large wooden bins, and now more and more to plastic bins. They are loaded on the trucks, they are brought to packing houses. However, before they are put in packing house, they are drenched with suspension containing antioxidants, which will help uh, to store fruit for a long period of time. And fungicides are added to the suspension. An entire truck is passing to the drenching system, and the drenching curtain is going through the fruit and is washing everything which is on the fruit, everything which is on the bin, and everything that is underneath of the bins, including some soil. So that suspension is recirculated and is changed only after about 350 or 400 bins pass through the drenching system. So you can imagine the amount of cross-contamination occurring right from the start. But if you take that suspension, and played on agar media and uh, wait for a few days. Uh, this is more or less what you can see. Variety of fungal colonies, mostly uh, pathogens causing fruit decays like penicillin, botrytis, or mucor. Many, many yeast colonies and some bacterial colonies. So I am, I'm thinking that it's probably self-explanatory why fungicides are added to the drenching suspension. But probably most of you are familiar with uh, limitation to fungicides. I just listed them here just to refresh your memory and only would like to point last two points. Uh, effect of uh, fungicide on human health and social sensitivity. Uh, public simply demands reduction in use of pesticides in general. This has been shown in many different surveys, especially in Europe. So we know that some kind of alternatives to synthetic fungicides are needed. So many, many years ago, when I started uh, developing program on, on biological control, oops, sorry about it, on biological control of, on palm fruits, I presented this flowchart of research, which hopefully would lead us to commercial product. So I will not have a time to talk about those individual points because each one probably will take separate presentation. But I would like to emphasize one point, the second one, about selection of search site for antagonists. Because at that time, we already knew that uh, bacterium isolated from soil producing antibiotics could control fruit decays on, uh, on peaches and nectarines. But, um, I was very fortunate to graduate, uh, to graduate from um, uh, 
plant pathology department at Washington State University, when, uh, where Dr. Jim Cook was the part of the department. Jim Cook is our biological control guru. He wrote several books on biocontrol. And according to his teaching, I knew I have to look for those antagonists, those beneficial microorganisms, in places where disease can occur, but it doesn't. So in my case, it was simply intact fruit in orchards just before harvest or immediately after harvest. So in quest for those uh, biocontrol isolation, those biocontrol agents, I went to completely unmanaged orchard and used either intact fruit at the beginning of our research, but later on fruit that was um, uh, slightly damaged with exposed uh, upper flesh tissue, and we also isolated microbes uh, from that area after exposing the tissue for several days before harvest. So, um, fruit surface is colonized by a variety of microbes. This is actually a picture from plums, but a similar situation is on apples and pears. And you could see a variety of microcolonies, uh, like in this case, uh, yeast microcolonies, uh, yeast microcolonies here and there, some fungal microcolonies. And then, if there is a damage on the fruit caused by insects or abrasion, uh, those microorganisms grow very rapidly. Uh, bacteria generally grows around lenticel cavities. Oh, so if you wash the fruit uh, and you plate a dilution plate on agar media, this is more or less what you can see. Uh, in the, the first case, uh, you could see here a variety of uh, yeast and some bacteria. In other case, you can see there's some also some fungi. We were mostly interested in yeast and the bacteria, so we isolated them, purified them, and then we divide bacteria to gram-positive, gram-negative, and identify them to a variety of means, uh, recently mostly through genetic identification. And then we screen them for antagonistic activity. Oh, well, you end up with a huge collection of uh, bacteria and yeast from, isolated from a variety of fruit. And then we screen them for antagonistic activity. And those are just a, this is just an example of two good biocontrol agents one is the yeast on the left side, and the other is a bacterium L5966. It's a saprophytic strain of Pseudomonas syringae. So all of those fruits were wounded and inoculated with the pathogen, Penicillium expansum. And um, in case of apples, this tray here was uh, protect, also inoculated with the uh, yeast strain ST3E1. And in this case, we had um, bacterium L5966, uh, which was uh, commercialized later on. This is on pear. So, to make a long story short, together with uh, EcoScience, uh, we developed a commercial product called BioSafe, which is based on active ingredient saprophytic strain of Pseudomonas syringae. This product is on the market uh, since 1996, can be easily adapted to current practices. Uh, it, this use is expanding uh, to new commodities. Uh, so far, we don't know any negative effects and can prevent growth of food or pathogens, and I will talk about this in a moment. So this is a website from Jet Harvest Solution, which currently owns and produces BioSafe, basically indicating uh, different commodities for which uh, BioSafe is registered for use after harvest, and that includes apples, pears, cherries, actually potatoes, sweet potatoes. We're going to have a registration on uh, sugar beets uh, in the near future. So, as use of um, biosay was increasing, we got more and more uh, interest from the industry um, about effect of this uh, uh, product on the microbial quality of the fruit. And at that time, the major um, problem was contamination of apple cider with E. coli and potential new regulations. So uh, first we focus on this, and then once we show some data about E. coli, the question was, uh, so how about potential contamination with Listeria and Salmonella? And we had to go to that too. So the apples, after they are stored, or sometimes actually straight from the field, they are brought to packing houses, and they are unloaded, like in this case, from the plastic bins, uh, and they are handled in water. So all those uh, lines are lines with the water and the apples swimming in them. 
So if you unload a certain number of bins, after a while, this is what you will see, that water doesn't look very good. And it's again another point for cross-contamination. Uh, Bob Buchanan showed that very nicely, that there's a potential for internalization of uh, football pathogens, especially if the temperature of water is much lower than the temperature of fruit. And that water is simply sucked in through the kylex opening into apple core. So um, general recommendation still is to add chlorine to the suspension. And this is a recommendation from uh, Cornell University, basically staying in red here that if E. coli uh, were introduced into stem puncture on apple, a stem puncture wound is the most common wound on apples, uh, the contaminated fruit conceivably carry the pathogen to a consumer. And by chlorinating flume water on apple packing lines, packing, packing house operators can minimize uh, that possibility. So how about our biosafe? Well, biosafe um, is uh, applied on packing lines, generally toward the end of the packing lines, either as a bath, like in this case of pairs application, or as a, uh, together with waxes or even before uh, apples are waxed on packing lines. So uh, from our research, we knew that, um, that our biosafe bacterium can grow very nicely in apple wounds, and this is over six month period in apples stored at one degree C. And uh, you could see here uh, with the blue line, that's an increase um, when the bacterium is put to the wound over six months. And we add some nutrients like asparagine and proline, we can increase population of that bacterium, and we can actually even enhance biological control. So the first question about uh, E. coli was how it can survive in apple juice or apple cider, and we use saline as a control. And it can survive in saline quite well, also in apple juice survives well, but, uh, and actually in a, uh, undiluted cider. However, if the cider is diluted, it does not survive well at all. So the next question was, can E. coli grow in the wounds of apple, similarly to our biocontrol agent? Because this was against the general belief that pH of apple is too low for bacteria to grow. And well, most of the pathogens on apples are fungi. So in this case, we used three different strains, the pathogenic strain and two surrogate strains, because we knew that we cannot use for all experiments always pathogenic strains. So we inoculated wounds with different con initial concentration, and we put low concentration. You can see there is an exponential growth rate uh, in all three cases. But the major point here is that all of those strains end up about the same um, colony forming units per wound, which we call wound carrying capacity for the given organism. So then, of course, the next question was, what is the interaction of our biocontrol agent uh, bio, from BioSafe with E. coli? So this is a very simple experiment. Uh, golden uh, delicious apples were wounded and then co-inoculated with those two organisms, P. syringi from our BioSafe and E. coli as a mixture, or they were inoculated with our biocontrol agents 24 hours or 48 hours before putting E. coli. And E. coli in water was served as a control. So, I mean, E. coli in water inoculated to apples was served as a control. And apples were incubated for various periods of time. And this is what we observed when we recovered E. coli. The continuous line is uh, E. coli alone in wounds, and this is in the presence of our biocontrol agents. And those are three initial concentrations that we put into the wounds. So this is co-inoculation. And then if we uh, inoculated 24 hours before putting E. coli and recover E. coli at different times, again, we see this even better. E. coli grow by itself in the presence of our biocontrol agents. E. coli just stays there. Similar situation with 24, 48 hours pre-incubation. So basically, we did not kill E. coli, but we prevented E. coli from growing in the wounds. Um, 
So if you go to many packing houses, it is not very uncommon to see somewhere on the floor fruit here and there, and of course many, many fruit flies. So the next question was, can fruit flies carry E. coli from a contaminated fruit to healthy fruit? So we did several experiments, but this is just an example of one very simple experiment. That we did this uh, in laboratory under very controlled conditions, where in those chambers we wounded all those apples. Half of them we inoculated with E. coli, and half not. And inside we inserted anesthetized fruit flies. And then we closed the chambers, and after about one hour or so, those fruit flies awoke and they were flying all around and we allow this to happen for up to 48 hours. And after 48 hours, we put some CO2 into those chambers, so we put those fruit flies to sleep, and we incubated uh, those chambers for another up to 48 hours. And then we extracted wounds that were originally not inoculated with E. coli. And this is what we what got. This is the um, exposure a time to fruit flies, and this is incubation time after the exposure from zero to 48 hours. And in almost all cases, we found E. coli in those wounds which were not uh, inoculated originally, and the population were around 10 to the fifth colony forming units uh, per wound. So, um, of course, the next question was about Listeria, and um, there were a lot of uh, questions about it because Listeria is associated, of course, with foodborne pathogens and can be found on meat, seafood, dairy products, vegetables, and silage, of course. But it was actually relatively little work done on fruit. So it can uh, withstand uh, very harsh environmental conditions and is kind of a resistant to uh, many disinfectants. So we used that strain LCDC 81H61. So first thing was to uh, look for the um, growth curve at different pHs, and we can see here uh, in the media uh, that the growth for Listeria is quite broad, uh, but particular interest to us was this region uh, right here between 3.7 and about 4.8, because this is a pH of apple slices uh, depending on apple cultivar and maturity, so it can vary in that range. So yes, uh, this is the pH that uh, the stadia supposed to be grow should grow at um, this level. Again, we look for survival of the stadia in apple juice, and uh, in saline did not survive very well. But then in apple juice, whatever was 100% or diluted, it did not survive uh, almost at all after. Uh, 24 or 48 hours. So, of course, the next step was to look if Listeria can grow in apple slices. And uh, we looked this at 20 degrees. We can see nice growth here, actually, after two days. At 10 degrees, also eventually nice growth. At five degrees, initial decline, but then rebound, and we see that over and over again, it kind of a, like almost adjusts itself and start growing again. So, um, we knew that some pathogens can modify environment on the fruit. And in this case, we choose two pathogens, Penicillium expansum, causing blue mold, and Glomerella cingulata, causing bitter rot. And we mix them with uh, Listeria and put them to, on apple slices. And uh, this is what we see. Our control, Listeria in water, increased slightly. However, Listeria in presence of Penicillium decline almost to non-detectable level. And Listeria in presence of glomerella increase uh, uh, quite nicely, probably more than one log. Well, when we look at the pH, pH of the surface of the slices in this case, our original pH was 4.72. In case of our check with relatively little growth of Listeria, didn't change. But in case of um, uh, glomerella, it increased to 6.75. So it's no surprise why the population increased. And in the case of apple, uh, penicillin expansum, I should say, uh, pH declined to 3.81. So there is that uh, 
quite interesting uh, factor that needs to be taken into consideration uh, of those interaction of foodborne pathogens, um, patho uh, fruit pathogens, and also biocontrol agents. So the next uh, thing we did, we conducted screening of some of our good biocontrol agents that we know uh, work uh, to control fruit decays. And this was done by Dr. Uh, Maribel Abadias from Spain when she visited our lab. And we, uh, again, we mixed a variety of those strains with um, listeria and put them on, on apple slices. And after three days, we looked for the population of listeria. We could see right away that some of them cause reduction in population, some of them actually cause increased. Uh, perhaps some yeast are utilizing malic acid or some others and change the pH and so on. So uh, we selected those best antagonists and more control tests. We, we found that at 10 degrees C uh, on apple plaques, uh, three of those or four of those antagonists uh, either prevented listeria from growth because you could see the first first line here indicates listeria by itself, and this one is in presence of those uh, biocontrol agents that either did not grow or decline. And you could see that even better at 25 degrees, the same experiment at 25, uh, all of them caused a significant decline. So uh, the same situation uh, was with uh, Salmonella. We conducted extensive screening again, selected those best antagonists, and um, uh, look for population. This is at 25 degrees. Again, uh, Salmonella, Salmonella, oops, Salmonella by, by itself uh, in this uh, continuous line. And then uh, in the presence of uh, some of those antagonists, sometimes it rebounds, but in the case of this Coferina faggi, one of our biocontrol agents, it just uh, was hardly to even to detect. So I know this is a very busy table, but this was taken from a recent review paper by Dr. Siroli from the University of Bologna, uh, basically showing on the left um, different biocontrol agents uh, that were um, isolated against those three most wanted and least desirable, uh, E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella. And uh, those tests were conducted on fleshy apple tissue, whatever was slices, or, or uh, plaques or wounds, and they were conducted in a few key laboratories, mainly in Europe. Um, the laboratory in Leida, I should, be, oops, a laboratory in Leida, uh, with Dr. Vinas and and Yusol as as the main investigators, and uh, Dr. Abadias out there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a laboratory in. Um, uh, Girona, uh, uh, under direction of um, uh, Dr. Montesino, and of course Dr. Siroli from uh, Bologna University. Most of those programs use similar approaches that I demonstrated here to you. However, they all have their own twists, uh, and uh, the showing superiority of some of those antagonists over the others reported in literature, and they also reported on some mechanism, potential mechanism of that biocontrol. So um, I would like to say that I don't believe there is a silver bullet approach to control foodborne pathogens. And here, we would like to follow the harder concept, which was originally developed by Leistner in Germany in the late 70s, that you can produce a variety of those different hurdles. Uh, for example, we adapted this to our foodborne pathogens on apple slices, uh, temperature control. Um, adding some preservatives, uh, reducing the uh, amount of leaking nutrients, uh, mo mo uh, managing uh, water activity, uh, modifying atmosphere packaging, uh, lowering pH, uh, or adding that competitive macroflora. At a certain point, those um, pathogens, football pathogens, cannot overcome those hurdles, and they cannot increase in population, or even if the population orig originally increased, it will collapse. So, um, in conclusion, I would like to say that antagonists selected from natural microflora of fruit can be very effective in reducing population of foodborne pathogen on intact and minimally processed apples. 
In general, they don't have a negative effect on sensory qualities, although I need to say that in some cases we notice a little bit browning on, with some organism, uh, some antagonists um, toward the end of storage uh, of apple slices, and this is uh, one of the things that needs to be overcome, and a lot of those are lactobacilla actually doing quite well. In this regard, um, more knowledge is needed on behavior of football pathogen in the presence of antagonist, antagonistic and uh, phytopathogenic microflora. And uh, although major advances have been made in biocontrol of football pathogens on minimally processed apples, uh, commercial implementation has not yet materialized. And um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, there is no silver bullet approach for control of football pathogens, and well-crafted, hard approach is the best way to assure safety on minimally processed apples. Thank you. Um, very, very interesting presentation. Do you think this would work on something like, with a higher pH, like melons or cantaloupe? Oh. Yes, and actually we did some work on melons and, and cantaloupes. Uh, I could not present, here, be, present this here because it was about apples. Uh, but uh, we did it with some of our biocontrol agents and also with bacteriophages. But uh, that would be part of the last presentation also on meat product, right? Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, if, where was I? If you're making a, a, an inoculum like the BioSafe, right. uh, does it have to be pure cultures and you have to know everything that's in it, or can they be communities including unknown organisms? Oh no, this has been very much regulated. It has been uh, registered by EPA as a strain, BioSafe, was deposited under Budapest Treaty in the, in the depository, so it is very much controlled. And is there a way to make sure that that's all you've got in there? Well, you can take BioSafe and play it on the media. Yeah. And, and it, another question is, you use the word antagonist, which is not quite the same as just an organism that happens to be better adapted to a particular niche and wins out by uh, occupying all the, all the niches or all the locations or taking all the food that distinction? No, actually you just describe what antagonists could be. You describe one of the mode of action. Okay. Competition for limiting nutrients. So antagonists can utilize nutrients that the pathogen would like to utilize and then basically out-competes out the pathogen. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank